Good morning, everybody. You're very welcome. Uh, this is a celebration of all the work that's done. And it's been fantastic work done. And all the exams are over. All in the past. Um, so I'm looking forward to this. Um, because we've had a fantastic... Um, we've had a fantastic semester. Um, I guess one of the things that characterised this semester was... Uh, the international flavour of our class this year. Um, we have uh, students from central China and we have students from every extremity of Brazil, I think, and we have students from Washington State on the west coast and we have students from McMaster University in the eastern uh, provinces of Canada. And we have people from Limerick and Tipperary. And we might even have somebody from Cork. Uh, so we've had a fantastic variety, and it's been great. And I guess we just want to let you see the great work that's been done. Um, and we have a guest speaker, and I'll let Ross introduce our guest speaker, who's also from territories far away, uh, from Australia. So this is the future of civil engineering. It's very international. Uh, thanks, Tom, for allowing me to introduce our um, keynote speaker today. Um, Owen is a personal friend of mine. Um, we went to school with each other in Tralee. We went to college together um, in UCC. And since graduating, um, Owen has worked with our consulting engineers first in Cork and um, probably from 2007 onwards. He's been working in their Brisbane office. Um, and he's been on some fantastic, huge projects, um, projects in the order of um, a number of billion dollars. Um, and while I was visiting on last January um, in Brisbane, um, he was kind of describing some of these projects to me, and they were just so um, elaborate in terms of their design and, um, and construction, and in particular the um, the Riverbank project, which I'm glad to hear that Owen will be talking about, um, I just had in my head that you know, this this knowledge is worth sharing, and I'm, I'm glad to kind of see that coupled with a uh, trip home uh, for Christmas, <coughs> that Owen has agreed to join us and share some of those experiences. So, without further ado, Owen is going from Arrow. Turn off your mobile phones. <laughs> <laughs> Delighted. Thank you, Ross. Uh, it's very good to be here. Um, I think what Ross was describing there about his last trip to uh, Australia in January was where he basically heard me ranting on about too many problems. And, um, yeah, it's not that the projects were elaborate or complex, it was just they were just uh, full of problems. Um, but uh, I suppose in that time I was just preoccupied with, with that and boring Mr. Higgins. But just a brief bit of about myself. I'm glad that Ross uh, identified me as a carry man. Um, I went to the University in Cork and um, graduated in 2004. At the same time, I joined ARA, um, worked primarily in buildings practice and um, worked on a lot of different type of projects um, from residential to uh, pharmaceutical uh, type of work. Um, in 2007, I went to Brisbane. Uh, we, we had another mutual friend who also studied with us, and he was working in Brisbane. And he, he called us up and he said, look, he said, we need to hire somewhere between 100 and 200 people in the next 12 months. So can you get out to Brisbane? And that was the message that we received. And um, we, well, I, I took up the call, but I was only allowed to go actually for, for 12 months. Um, the guys in Cork said, look, we need you back in 2008. So I think we all know what happened in 2008. One year I extended to two years or three years and so on. So I'm pretty much there full time now. Um, the work I've been doing in Brisbane has been all uh, centered on, not on building structures but more on civil structures. And um, civil structures, um, I, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but there's uh, a lot of intricacy involved there. And, uh, the buildings, you often can do a standard detail and repeat it 30 times over in, in, a, in a building. In, in bridges, uh, so you're not that fortunate very often. So um, I also put up there that I'm actually <laughs> studying as well. I was going to try and empathise with you guys. I thought you guys would be doing exams. I was trying to study over Christmas. I just learned that there is no exams 
anymore in January. It's actually all done then, so good stuff, well done. Um, I'm doing a, a master's in bridge engineering, and a lot of my colleagues in, in, in Brisbane will say, like, why, why are you doing that? Why don't you do an MBA, or why don't you do something in business? And the reason is that um, all my experience is really much uh, focused on concrete bridges. Some of them are quite complex, but I never get to do anything really with steel. Uh, steel is not something that's it's too expensive in Australia. Uh, cable support structures are, um, are few and far between. It's an area of low seismic activity, so we do very little earthquake engineering and things like bridge management. I mean, all the, the bridges are really relatively new in Australia, well, a lot of them are. So um, there is the same focus on uh, asset management, maintenance, that sort of stuff. So a lot of that is captured in, by the University of Surrey, and it's something I recommend to, to everyone here for, for future study. So, I suppose what I want to talk about today is a couple of things. Um, I threw this together. I, I arrived back on Monday and pretty much on Tuesday I started putting this together. Um, I want to talk about a short story. It's a story that I, I like. Um, I, I can't um, emphasize enough how important this story is. I, I heard it myself last March. Two, uh, two professors from Canada were traveling uh, the world giving lectures on, uh, on shear design. And these two were. They're basically the world leaders in, um, in research into uh, the concept of shear. And a lot of the codes around the world, design codes, are being rewritten by the, the research that these guys are doing, including in Australia. But they, they, they told a great story, and it's one I'd like to repeat today. It's, it's just uh, a funny thing. Um, well, it's also tragic, but um, it's just worth uh, knowing the, the, the learnings of that story. In the middle, it's probably the stuff that I'll probably <coughs> board Mr. Higgins on before, I'll probably bore you on as well. I'll try and flash it out really quickly at some of the projects I've worked on, um, mainly the bridges and energy jetties. Uh, and then lastly, I'll try and wake you all up just to uh, run through some uh, key messages. So, this is a bridge near Edinburgh, Firth or Forth. I don't know if anyone has seen it. It's, uh, it's quite an impressive structure. Um, it uh, is for a railway. And, and, and before this bridge was built or even designed, there was a big bridge disaster in Scotland called the Tate River Bridge Disaster, where a train went over a bridge. It was uh, a massive storm, and the combined bridge, um, sorry, rail loading and the wind loading actually took the bridge down, and 70 or 80 people were killed. So at the time, uh, there was a big emphasis on not. Uh, having another repeat of, of that. So this, this structure was built, uh, designed by two guys, uh, Baker and Fowler. And this picture down the bottom is a famous picture that many of you have seen, have seen before, but it was to describe the principle of this uh, bridge structure, which is a balanced cantilever. So basically, the, the two guys there, which is Baker and Fowler, they've got a Japanese colleague sitting between them, suspended. But um, their, their arms are outstretched, and, and their arms are in tension. Um, what they depend on is they depend on these blocks here to, to keep their arms um, held out, and they also depend on the, the, the strut, which is this compression lever down the bottom. So on the bottom um, right-hand corner of, of the presentation, there is um, there's a, just a, a simple low-path uh, low diagram showing where the tension and compression would be. So you have the tension of the top members, typically, and the compression down the bottom going to the, to the support. Another similar structure is the Quebec Bridge. Um, I hear there's a Canadian in the audience, so I think she might be familiar with, with where this is going. Um, designed by Theodore Cooper, an American, and the Phoenix Bridge Company were based in Pennsylvania. Um, similar form of construction, but um, I might just flash back to the previous slide and see if notice any differences or uh, similarities. In fact, even this, this photo down here looks quite different to, to this photo. So um, this was, uh, the span was going to be a, a little bit bigger. Uh, you can see that this, this was a 520 meter span, this was a 550 meter span approximately, but it was also going to be a lot less steel used. So on the evening of the 29th of August 1907, the, the, that cantilever actually collapsed, and uh, it collapsed very quickly. Uh, it was in less than 15 seconds for the whole thing to come down. There was 75 fatalities, and the cause at the time was reported as being unknown. 
and there was a Royal Commission set up to, to investigate this picture of the, the wreckage. So it's a fairly serious incident. Um, the, the findings of the, the, the commission sort of are laid out here. I've categorized them as fundamental faults, technical faults, and then there's, there's some human faults on the next slide. But as I was writing this on Tuesday, I sort of realized that the fundamental faults, I mean, all these still exist today. And uh, it's, it's things that we battle with every day. So the first is that you know, things get awarded often to the, the best and cheapest tender. So, I mean, another way of saying that is that we'll get awarded, projects get awarded to the cheapest tender very often. They don't always have to be the best. Um, the design was carried out in, between New York and Pennsylvania. The construction was 1,000 kilometers away. And um, I mean, this is fairly common. Uh, the projects I've worked on have been designed in Brisbane, built in Singapore. So there's a massive communication problem there. Um, inexperienced company were considered quite inexperienced. There was a side inspector also considered inexperienced. Some of the technical faults, um, the, the span was increased by 200 uh, feet late in the design and no changes were made uh, afterwards. This, this um, increased the mass of the, the central span significantly. Um, they also learned when the steel was arriving to site, um, it was a couple of percent, a little bit higher. Um, the, the working stresses were in, in the original design, so forgetting about the increases in mass of about 20%. The working stresses were about 10% over than was allowed at the time. And then in, in the, the critical months leading up to the collapse, there was um, some of the compression members were, were bowing. I just show this little diagram over here. And um, by bowing, when, when you put too much compression on a strut um, or a column, you, you, get, you get this, uh, this deflection in, in the middle um, if, if you start to exceed its buckling. So they recorded these um, these measurements here. So 57 millimeters is, is quite significant. It's probably about that much for for a, a steel member. I'm not sure how long it would have been, but um, this was recorded. It was sent to, to New York, and two days before the collapse, it was agreed that um, that work would be suspended. Now. Um, between that agreement happening two days before the, 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 um, the collapse and before that message got to the site, um, it, it was just lost, basically, in, in communication. And uh, the inspector had to, travel from, had to travel from Quebec down to, to New York to meet Mr. Cooper, and in all that time, uh, that was a critical moment, and uh, unfortunately, the collapse happened. Um, the, the other aspect on the, the human factor I want to talk about is just Mr. Theodore Cooper, um, when, when he saw the, the Firth of Forth, he said that, you know, uh, that, that's his quote there, he said it was the most awkward piece of engineering, in his opinion, ever constructed. And he also said that an American could have uh, constructed using half the material and half the cost. So he very much had a, a strong opinion on that. And, uh, and there was no one to dispute that at the time uh, in, in, in the Americas. So um, what happened afterwards? Uh, he, he didn't go to jail or anything, but um, he was quite advanced in his career. He um, very much um, was disgraced after that, unfortunately. And um, the structure had to be rebuilt. I think it was opened in 1917. Um, the, the story has actually just been caught by uh, an Irishman who actually also lives in Brisbane. His name is Sean Brady. And um, it's been summarized in, in those two, the, the most recent um, publications by the structural engineer. So I was able to glean a lot of the facts from those, but um, that's, I think it's just a very important story about um, just the, 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 the human factors, the, the, the fundamental faults, the ego involved, and a lot of that still exists today, so you will uh, experience this in, in your career. To talk about some of the things that, um, that I've, I've worked on, um, I worked in a job in Brisbane uh, called the Airport Roundabout Upgrade, it was part of the Airport Link Project, which is a $5.8 billion Australian um, uh, basically tunnel and at the end there was uh, this nice bridge. Um, I, was, I got involved early and um, I got involved when we were doing the, the conceptual design and we had decisions to make whether we would have a, a single box girder 20 meters wide or twin boxes. Um, and then on the form of construction, so the form of construction for, for these type of structures is very um, 
very dependent on where the site is. So the, the airport roundabout is in the airport roundabout was the busiest uh, intersection in uh, in Queensland at the time. Um, I just basically grabbed a whole series of photos to try and uh, demonstrate the scale of it. So this is a the start of a cantilever. So that, that gantry on the top that basically erects segments um, from from the ground up, and then um, the, these these ones here these actually um, these have a jack at the end, and they will stress stress tendons, um, so post tensioning um, between one side of the cantilever and the other. Um, the force in, in, in that in those tendons is uh, somewhere between four and eight times the actual mass of the segment itself. So you can see there's a segment been lifted that's about 55 tons in weight. Um, another photo to show how far it comes out. So, so the span is about 56 meters, and um, that's probably half a cantilever completed. So that being over about 28 meters. And then some nighttime shots. We, we were constructing this all through the night. So we spent about um, spent about a year in the design office and a year uh, constructing this project. It was quite successful, this aspect of it. Um, this was one part of a, of a massive project, and um, a lot of the, the people involved in the construction side would have said this was the most successful um, area on the whole job, um, specifically because we weren't down in a hole in a tunnel, uh, struggling with rock and mud and water and all sorts of stuff. Uh, that, that's, that's an image of how it's completed today. If, if anyone comes to Brisbane in the future, um, when you come from the airport, you go to the city, you either go over it or you go under it, one or the other. Um, that, that was a very enjoyable project. Um, that, <coughs> I suppose my knowledge of post tensioning and segmental construction advanced enormously uh, during that project. And that led me to work on one where we, we won a design competition. And this, is, this was in Singapore. And um, there was an architect involved, and uh, some, some of you guys will start to work with architects uh, soon. And that's uh, also fun and challenging at the same time. But um, this was quite a quite a, uh, a structure in terms of its uh, span to depth ratio. So, so our, the main span of it is um, is 95 meters, and um, we have to you know, really push a lot of uh, boundaries here. So we've, we've absolutely loaded this thing post tensioning. Um, I was worried at certain points that the thing might just blow up, such was the force we were putting into it. But um, we used an, an AD MPA concrete in, in this bridge, um, so it's, um, it's quite, quite stable. Um, as I said, 1.5 meter mid span, so um, one, of the, one of the loadings that the, the client wanted was um, for Singapore National Day. Uh, a whole series of, of local people to be able to come onto the bridge and start dancing, and um, well, we, we quickly discouraged that idea because of the, the, the likely response uh, to the dynamic loading that, that would reduce. Some, some photos um, that is on the top left corner that's the, the precast shell, that's one half of what we put on the pier. Uh, the pier, like there's a shot on the right. We actually had to split the pier um, <coughs> to, to to make the, the pier more flexible um, because the, the whole thing is integral and in time with these structures with post tensioning the, the, the central span would um, start to shrink and uh, would close in and, uh, and that shortening effect would um, put a, quite a big strain on the piers. So, so the pier is actually split in two. This is a photo from I think June of uh, this year where the key segment is about to, to get placed um, and there's also a whole other range of impressive structures in the background in that structure in that photo. Um, this one is it just shows some of the tendons sticking out so um, the, the, the post tensioning jack will eventually come in here and, um, and again put huge loads something of the order of three to four meganiums on each one of those points so, so one of my colleagues um, went on the site visit in, in June and took that photo, which I tried to align here with the architectural render. Uh, it's coming quite close. Um, it's pretty much in the center of um, Singapore. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing it in, um, in person. Uh, since we won the competition, I've not been invited back to Singapore. Um, so we'll have to happen. Um, 
back in January 2011, um, Brisbane experienced um, a fairly substantial flood. And this flood, I think it claimed the lives of about 15 people. Um, it was just uh, torrents of rain for, for about a month. And that rain all got backed up in a dam. And the, the dam came to a point of nearly um, over, over topping. So a decision had to be made to release a lot of water. And uh, it was unfortunate because at the same time it was a high tide. Brisbane is a, is a river city. Um, there's a, a river that meanders all the way through. There's uh, many, many bridge structures. But there was um, a floating boardwalk which you know, was connected to the CBD and uh, one of the most popular suburbs called New Farm. And it had three to 5,000 people using it a day, running and cycling on it. Um, but the photo there shows the flood taking it away. So, so the flood eventually unzipped this, this structure. Um, what was floating, um, all those little concrete pontoons, um, they ended up going off down the river, bashing into people's boats and their marinas and um, getting stuck under other bridges. And, um, I remember at the time I was actually here in Ireland and I was a bit concerned about my car and I had to get a guy to move the, the car so that it wouldn't go under. But um, when I landed back in, I remember looking out the window of the plane and you could see all these little pontoons out in the bay, just like little Lego black blocks and I was floating out there. Um, so this is probably, it's been the bane of my life for the last couple of years. Um, it's just finally completed. Um, very challenging project. Um, clients wanted everything and um, had very little time to, to allow us to do anything. So the, the project was very constrained by program and funding. So, so the government, uh, the federal government in Australia gave um, many millions of dollars to the local council to replace the structure and um, we had to come up with uh, ideas very quickly on how to uh, to get a contractor appointed and um, how to how to design and, and then I suppose to prove something to be flood immune. So um, the, the site criteria was to be flood immune for a one in two thousand year event. Now, um, that's, that's a flood of biblical proportions. I mean, the, on the scale of it, it would require that, that big dam outside Brisbane to fail completely and for all of Brisbane to be flooded. If that happened, the, the, the casualties to Brisbane would be immense. Um, it wouldn't be the flood that would probably uh, be so, so detrimental to, to the people. It would be more the, um, the lack of drinking water. Um, in the design criteria, um, we have to make it fixed, we have to try and uh, make it low maintenance, so eliminate things like bearings, etc. So, again, we, what we thought about there was a form of segmental construction, which was uh, span by span. And um, each of those pillars there, you see, again, it, I'm glad there's a little, um, a little concrete truck in there, because it gives you an idea of scale. So each of these beams here would be about 30 meters long, and they're about 1.2 meters deep. And they weigh about 200 tons. Um, again, the, the force we, we put on the, the force tension at the ends is about 800 tons. So, so we're essentially squashing that, that beam by about four times its own weight. So, um, so if, if one of those beams was just to turn over on the side, the thing would definitely blow up. Um, we, we proposed a whole series of ideas that the contractor who came along loved, including a little rail system. So we, we cast them here. Um, on, on the riverbank, and we put in little rails where, um, where these little beams could be skirted along, and a, a, a barge mounted crane would come along, pick them up, and land them on piles. Um, one of the struggles we had was uh, with the piles. So the riverbed varies in depth from 10 to 32 meters, and, and that's just to rock. Um, this is on the outside of a river bend. It's not a great place to put any structure, really, to be honest. Um, and uh, there's very little mud in certain places. Uh, there was one pile which was 32 meters tall, and uh, many other piles were 20 meters, 26 meters tall. But um, a peer engineer, um, a peer reviewer, uh, came to assess our design, and he told us that the um, structure could not be built. And we, we, had, we had awarded the contract to a, a contractor, and we said, well, please explain why the, the, the structure can't be built. He said, well, he said, you, you will fail the pile as soon as you try and land one of those little beams on it, 200 ton beams. We 
he said, well, we've considered that, but we, we won't. And he said, well, you're blocking to you. He was adamant. So we, we asked him, you know, how, how will we, or, or what tells him that that will happen? And he, he went to um, a piece of computer software and said, look, the computer tells us that your thing will fall down. And he said, well, we don't take the word of your computer software. It's the software can't explain to us why, why it gives that answer. And he couldn't give us an answer, and so we agreed to disagree, pressed on, and we um, got it built. Um, so it was a little nerve wracking at certain points when we were putting the beans in, but the beans, the pilots didn't work up, thankfully. Um, this gives you an idea of uh, just a cross section of, of this one. Um, and this is basically the different um, flat heights. So up there, that's the Q2000. Um, this is the Q100 here, which took the, the last uh, structure, and this is the typical tidal range uh, in there. So, um, so if another one in 100 year event comes along like the 2011 one, um, we will see this uh, structure go, go under. So that would be a big test. Now to, to satisfy ourselves about um, its resilience, we engaged the University of Auckland to um, hydraulic modeling. So, so this is th th this photo here is a bit deceptive. Uh, it doesn't actually show you the, the scale of this tank. Uh, this is quite a, a wide tank. Um, this this element, this black element here, is about two meters long. So in total, it's um, the tank I think is about four or five meters wide, and it can carry a massive flume of water. In it. So, um, so we took the scale model. We put some load cells on it, which were sensitive to about half a newton. And um, we blasted it in many different angles and directions and depths and speeds. And um, we were doing this number one to, to, to I suppose, validate the, the uh, accepted design practice for um, for loads uh, from water flow. So it's it's well understood and well documented how how this pile here would behave when water flows past it. And even if the pile was square or triangular or any shape, a lot of that study has been done. And um, it's closely related to the aeronautics, I think, that which happens in, in here. Um, but how this shape here would behave and respond, we, we didn't know. And there was only so much guidance set that we could um, you know, review and, and, and learn from. Um, what we did learn from this was that this shape here, this cross section, um, has got some interesting features, and that is that when the flood is coming up to under top it, or sorry, over top it, that the water, when it's rushing by here, it, it actually gets forced down underneath. It, it can't go over because the, the flood hasn't reached that high yet, but the water is, um, the drag and the downward force is um, far more than current design codes and standards uh, would have allowed us to believe. So we learned that quite late, we were whole redesign based on that. That was quite interesting. The second thing we learned is that when, when, the, flood, when the flood waters are up here and flowing past it, bear in mind that, that this, this is where the river water floods, um, the direction of the flood is this way, and it's, it's also the direction of the, um, the structure. But the, the water floods in this direction, it actually has um, an aerofoil effect. So similar to the, the wings on an aircraft, but the flanges of the, the, the corridor actually um, create more uplift. So, um, so what, what, what the flood is running parallel with this, it wants to lift it off. And uh, that was another really interesting learning from that. It's just a quick idea of how quick the construction was. Um, the first beams, first girders were landed in February 2014. We thought it would be a good idea to get some aerial for our job. And within um, six months, between February and, and July, the whole thing is in. Um, one of the more challenging aspects was uh, this photo down here on the right. That's actually a, a swing bridge. Um, it's a, it's a, um, a, a rotating structure which allows boats to go in and out because uh, you'll see there's a small pontoon there. So some of the local um, residents had their access uh, cut off by putting the structure in. So uh, that, that design, that, that, um, that required a lot of um, coordination with mechanical, hydraulic, electrical um, disciplines, and uh, in, in particular control systems, so, um, so logical programming, etc. So uh, that was one of the most satisfying ones. 
I did have a video of that opening, but it was something like three or four gigabytes. I don't think the, who could take it. I'll just flash this really quickly. Um, other things we do in, in Brisbane when we're not really busy with bridges, because um, as you know, economies go up and down, and investment in infrastructure uh, took a hit uh, after we did all those projects. But um, what we did for some of the, the private sector was uh, build some of these jetties. Um, it was three jetties, required by three different clients. So this is a place um, about 800 kilometers north of Brisbane. It's called Kirkus Island. And there's a massive LNG um, industry now uh, taking gas out of the ground in, in central Australia and piping it here to this island. And then from here, processing it and actually delivering it uh, on the vessels. So three completely separate projects. And um, they were the names of them. Um, and we, we struck up with good. Um, a good agreement with a contractor called John Holland, where we agreed that we would um, be the designer in a DNC or a DNB contract. And um, this, this was a huge work for us. Um, so I'll just go back a couple of slides to just to talk through what a jetty is all about. A jetty is um, it's like a bridge over the, the water, but um, at this end here, this is a loading platform, and that's where. Um, where these massive towers, which are designed in France, they, they basically can load the LNG, which is at minus 160 degrees, onto, um, onto some of the biggest ships in the world. The, the loading platform itself, uh, it's basically a big slab um, built using some precast and monolithic pores, um, and it stands on two steel piles. But what took us uh, an awful long time uh, were these little guys out here. These are called dolphins. So these four here, these will take the, the impact of the ship just bashing into it ever so gently, but the, the force is massive. And then these other uh, dolphins to the side, they are, um, they're called mooring dolphins. And basically the, the vessel ties all its, its ropes up um, against those. The vessel sometimes would be um, the, the, the bow on the, the stern, I think it is, that they would be uh, longer than this whole structure. Um, so designing those dolphins took an awful long time. Um, the reason we won the project is pretty much uh, because we used a vertical power system. So that was why we spent so much time and effort on those ones. A dolphin typically, and again all, all the rivals for these projects were used uh, raking piles. And raking piles are a hell of a lot more expensive, um, far better than vertical piles because they um, resist uh, a lot of lateral load actually, which is good, but uh, the contractors told us that yes, we wouldn't have won the, the project if it wasn't for the vertical cause. So that's just a summary of um, some of the things I have uh, been doing in Brisbane for the last seven years or so. Um, there is, uh, just going back to the Canadian guys who came and told us the stories, they, they gave us um, something to remember and I really like this. I think if, good enough for, for them, it's probably good enough for all of us. Um, and it's, it's, it's a model of the University of Toronto for civil engineers. So the first thing they, they say is that, you know, just don't forget that force is, is mass times acceleration. So it's, it's a nice way of saying, um, you know, water flows downhill or you know, gravity will, will be there. The second thing is, um, comes up. The second thing is, um, it's, it's, it's the best part of their, their, their motto, it's, um, it's you can't push a rope. And um, I mean, there's always a lot of confused faces about why, why can't you push a rope. Um, it's, the purpose of this is to remind people that there are certain elements and members that are really good in compression and others that are really good in, in tension. So tension members, steel is pretty good, compression members, um, concrete Answer, you must know the answer, and um, th this is, I suppose, um, very important for, for all of us. That is that before you do any work, before you sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil, or before you um, get out your computer and do a 3D model of anything, 
you need to know what you're going to be getting out at the end of it. And, um, it's, it's, it's very important. Uh, communication is key. Um, I think uh, as you guys uh, go on, you, you'll realize that um, the better you can understand people, and I think listening is probably the most important thing about communication, uh, the better you understand people, uh, the more progress you will make. And, um, so communication, uh, I think you, you, I'm looking forward to seeing your presentations today, but uh, it's something that we all have to work on. And, um, yeah, uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, don't ever be afraid to ask any questions. Um, the, I think everyone knows this, but still people might be timid and shy not to uh, want to appear that they don't know something. But I think uh, when you start work, ask as many questions as possible. For anyone interested in structural engineering, um, uh, I'm certain that many of you aren't, and that's, that's, that's all, all good. Um, but remember that depth is always king. So if you've ever got a problem where something is, is not strong enough or, um, or not stiff enough, uh, and don't confuse the strength and stiffness, uh, depth will, um, if you can improve, increase the depth of anything, you will, uh, you will solve your problem most likely. The first principles. Um, I'm sure you've probably recognized some of these. Um, it's more important than, than computers. And that brings me to my favorite. My, yeah, this, this is worth waiting for. I'm sure you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's about computers, really. And, uh, <laughs> of course, this, this, this computer is trying to fight me now, but basically. Um, we, we, we take in lots of graduates every year, and um, we, um, we're always um, surprised that there's a, a, a huge dependency on, um, on computers. And people think that if you, if you do a, a computer model or, um, or a finite element model or you know, hydraulic um, modeling of a river or geotechnical finite element model, and you can give the answer to three decimal places that, that that's the answer. And um, it's um, something that we always try and um, guide people away from. That uh, it, it's like a third model on the, the University of Toronto that to, to, to know the answer you need to, uh, to find an answer you need to know what you're looking for. This, this guy is one of my heroes. Um, I don't think this will work because the computer I think, knows what's coming. But, uh, <laughs> but this is just a, a guy who gets uh, very frustrated with where he's working. <laughs> he ends up just smashing He's one of my heroes. This is how I feel very often at work. Um, yeah, it's not good. Maybe I'll just push this computer off the, um, off the desk like he did. But anyway, um, unavailable. YouTube it. It's worth it. <laughs> so I think that's, that's pretty much it. So, um, thank you so much. Thanks, Owen. Uh, Any questions? Do you do have questions? Yeah, with something like the Singapore Project, Singapore Project um, how many engineers were you working in the main office? First off. And, and in Australia. Yep. And second off, how many of the engineers working on the project fly out and see the site? Uh, good question. So there was four of us designing it mm -hmm. in Brisbane. And we were all actually pretty much the same age. And then the, the local guys in Singapore were doing the project management and they were doing the site coordination. Um, I'm kind of glad you asked me that question because I'll, I'll tell you about the most satisfying part of the project for us. We were at loggerheads, the two offices. We, we were, you know, struggling with them. And um, there was a, a storm rolled in one night in prison, and um, we we were there at the midnight work on this job. We had to go home, so we're these things called cab charges. You can get a cab charge, you just get, grab a taxi, and cab charge pays for your taxi. So we did that one night, and then um, 
But two weeks later, the guys in Singapore said, hey, what's this? Cap charges. You're not allowed to put expenses on the job. You know, hurry up and finish. And we were pretty much demented at that point. So the very next day, the four of us decided that we'd all go down to a water park and uh, spend the whole day, uh, on a Wednesday afternoon, doing going down water slides and uh, having a tough time. And uh, we put all that time on the job as well. So, <laughs> sorry, guys. You're going to annoy us so much. Um, but the, the point is that the, the communication had gotten to such a point where um, you know, working until midnight and a, a taxi was causing friction. And, um, yeah, um, so I've not, I've not been to the site, I've only been there once before they actually started piling. Uh, I went there once to try and sell the, the competition solution, um, but um, I need to go back and visit. It, it should be open, I think, in January, February. Mm. Other questions? How do you make 80 Newton concrete? 80? And just for people who are not engineers, it's about two and a half times the strength of what's over your head. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Um, there is a lot of adversity, and um, it's actually quite common in, um, in for concrete cores in buildings. So for, for most of the high rises now that are being constructed in Australia and in Southeast Asia, it is AB and BA concrete. Um, what actually goes into it, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, one of the things about that concrete was that um, because it was uh, such a high cementitious um, <coughs> component of it, we were quite worried about the creep. But in Singapore, uh, it's such a humid place, um, the creep uh, coefficient is actually very low. So, um, but to, to answer your question about what the components are, I uh, couldn't uh, call it off the top of my head. Do you have any examples of how? A computer model actually gave you what was completely, obviously, the wrong answer. That, well, that, that one on Riverwalk, where um, the, the, the peer reviewer, engineer, told us that his computer model told him it fell down. And we, we, we went back and forth for a couple of weeks about all the different inputs on it, but he um, flatly refused to believe us. So we, you know, this was held firm and um, so was, uh, crossed our fingers and, and hoped it worked and it did. But um, we, and we I think uh, probably go back a few slides. Um, so there was and computers can be very helpful as well. Don't get me wrong. It's this 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 bit here, this is a cantilever here which on the same project that had um, that had a temporary pile underneath it. And the, the load on the pile, uh, the temporary pile, was, um, was about one mega newton. And um, we had, um, like that, that cantilever sticks out about, um, it's, they're very small here, but it sticks out about, um, sticks out about, uh, I think, seven or eight meters from the, the main support. And the main support was vertical. When you, when you drop um, a mega newton, the whole structure wants to tip and lean. So we were very concerned about that, and we spent a long time uh, looking at it. Uh, one of our guys, um, and, and a genius of a, of a character, especially when it comes to um, data management and processing and all that, he, um, he did the study on, on how much that cantilever would deflect because we were very dependent on uh, the stiffness of the mud, uh, the stiffness of the pile, the cracked stiffness of the concrete. Um, there was a steel liner around the, the, the concrete pile as well, so the, the number of parameters was massive. But um, our man in Brisbane anyway predicted this to be a deflection of, uh, he told me, 21 millimeters. And uh, the contractor tried to tell us that it didn't work and it failed. Uh, we, we told the contractor it would deflect by 30 millimeters, so we put a 1.5 fat code. And then we went down in the day and we stood on that, on that balustrade and, and watched it drop down. And um, the first one dropped by 19 millimeters, and the second one dropped by 23 millimeters. And um, the amount of analysis and process to, to get there was immense, but uh, we, we were lucky we got the right answer. Um, so I mean, that's, that was the opposite to your question, but um, yes, it, it can be very useful, very good. But uh, the other answer is our proof engineer friend. 
refuse to play with them. Anything else? I'm just interested in that peer engineer. Who paid him? Uh, the, the, the same people who paid us. So that was the council, the city council. So did he have a statutory role? Would say, were you? How did you get past him? In other words, could he have stopped you? Um, when we signed our contract, that was not in our scope of work. Um, that we had to, um, uh, I suppose, get sign off from uh, a third party. So that came late in the job, and we, we embraced it, and we, we, we value checking. Um, and, uh, because of that, uh, that was quite controversial. Uh, we, had, we were just on the cusp of signing a contractor. We turned around to the client and we said, look, what we can do here is we can take this problem and actually give it to our colleagues in London. And just we'll step back from it, and they can assess it independently from us. And we will call that the independent review. So the client actually accepted that. And um, I won't say that, that the peer review was dismissed or anything. Um, they eventually came to a certain junction and were parked. So. Okay, I guess we better we better get cracking with the that's fantastic.